still on Matthew chapter 4 from verse 12 onwards. Now, if we look at the outline, we have just finished the first part, the temptation of Jesus, verse 1 to 11. We are now looking at the second part, Jesus begins his ministry. So after the blessing, after the battle, now it is ministry. So verse 12. Now when Jesus heard that John, John the Baptist, had been put in prison, and he was put in prison by this uh, Herod, Atipas. And uh, when Jesus heard this, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. Let's look at the map. Let's look at this so you have an idea of where Jesus was. So, he was here on, in Jericho, then he was taken to, probably in the spirit, to Jerusalem, to the high point. But the, the wilderness is this area. So whether it's around here or here, but it's in the wilderness. And so now, when he heard, when he heard that uh, John the Baptist was put in prison, he departed to Galilee. That means he went north. Wherever he was, he went north. To where? To Capernaum. But he left Nazareth. So he must have, after, you see, this Matthew did not record the gospel in chronological order. That means day one, day two, day three, day four. But on events that he can highlight and teach the Israelites at that proof and show to them this is King Jesus. But generally it is uh, in that direction. So he went north and he must be in Nazareth where he grew up. And then from there he went to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was a major city. Capernaum was the capital of Jesus' ministry. And when we were there, I, I had done some teaching even while we were there to show to you that this was the capital and HQ of Jesus' ministry where he did many things. And I've got this, I found this this uh, map for you and uh, actually it's quite useful. But this map shows all of Jesus' ministries at the various sites in Israel. So you see, all these are boxes of what he did of Jesus, teaches on marriage, Jesus, uh, uh, spoke to all oh, his disciples. So, okay. so, but the biggest box is where? Here. And it is where? At Capernaum. In fact, he did many ministries around here. But today, you go to that place, that area, Capernaum and uh, Poseida, Chor Chorazin. You find all these places are in ruins. We will come to that. Will come to get. They, they received the word, they received the light, but they were not faithful. And Jesus said, the day will come, even Sodom and Gomorrah uh, would be better off than you. Because they received the light, but they didn't do much. Anyway, so he went there. And I'll come to the reason why he went to Zebulun and Naphtali. That's in verse 13, right? So you look at this, this were the 12 tribes of Israel in, on this map where they were located. We have studied this in the Old Testament. So this is the Sea of Galilee and near the north, near the Sea of Galilee, you have Zebulun, one tribe, you have Naphtali, the other tribe. And then Capernaum is here. So he went to that region. Now, why did he go there first? We will come to that shortly. But before we begin, I added this. Jesus' years of ministry. He All in all, about three years. The first year, it was obscurity. Remember, 
every time he pray and he heal, because we are talking about his ministry, we're going to learn about his ministry. So I just want to give you the background first. And when he prayed and people get healed, he told them, go and report it to Strange Times, have it on CNN. Is that what he said? No. Tell no one. Tell no one. Keep it quiet. Why? Because he didn't want a circus to follow him. He didn't want people who are out, who are there out of curiosity, just, just to come and see him as if it is a magic show. He wanted to do his ministry, to start his ministry. But there will be a time later when he will tell us, he will tell the disciples, go and make disciples. Go forth. He will send them out. But there is a timetable. The timetable is not now when he started. So he told them, keep quiet. So year of obscurity. Then into the second year, it was year of popularity. And everywhere, people were following and people were blessed. And it wasn't a quiet thing anymore. But in the final year, it was the year of rejection. And that led him to be crucified at Calvary. So, looking at that, let's look again back to here. So, in leaving Nazareth, verse 13, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. Now, what is the meaning of Capernaum? In the original text, is Ka Fa Nam. Ka. Ka is like village. K F A R. Nahum. You know, we study the Old Testament minor prophet Nahum. Kafanum. But the meaning means comfort. Comfort. Village of comfort. Yeah. Why not? The lake, no. By the lake, it's so cooling. And, and actually, when you go to Israel, it is really a wonderful place. When it's the right season and, 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 and the weather is so it's beautiful. And so that place is village comfort, comfort village. And the people got too comfortable. After all the blessings and Jesus went there first. Went there first. Did so much in Capernaum. And they got too comfortable. So don't just sit and receive all the blessing and yet do nothing in obedience you will also be obsolete. So, draw in Capernaum, which is by the sea. And this area, uh, history tells us that there were 200 over villages, quite a few hundred thousand people there, a lot of people. So Jesus went there. And in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, pointed out to you up there, that it might be fulfilled. So this is uh, Matthew's formula. Take the Old Testament, show to you, ah, fulfillment. So you, okay, yes, this is as God prophesies, uh, God's word. So this is King Jesus, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. What is that? Verse 15. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. So this is Jordan, beyond the Jordan. Galilee of the Gentiles. So this area is Galilee. And this area has lots of Gentiles. There were also Jews, but there were Gentiles, many. The people who sat in darkness, who have, no, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region, and shadow of death, light has dawned. And these people were sitting in darkness. And went on to say, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, that means this region, Zebulun and Naphtali, they were sitting in darkness, they, they had experienced uh, 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 death. It has been a bad time. How so? You know, in the Old Testament which we studied, before the Babylonians came down, the Assyrians came down first, right? And the Assyrians took the northern kingdom into exile. A hundred years later, then the Babylonians came and captured the southern kingdom and brought them up. 
So the Assyrians came down first, and then the first hit was who? Naphtali, and then Zebulun. So these were the, historically, these were the first two tribes taken by the Assyrians into exile. And when that happened, you know, they were not going to, they were not going on a holiday tour package. They were going into exile, difficult times ahead. And so they were in darkness. And Christ, the light, light has dawned. They have seen a great light. Who is this great light? Jesus. And Jesus came for these people first. Because they were the first to be taken away and to be in the darkness. So Jesus came to them first in Capernaum to these people who had been in the darkness longest, if I may say, compared to the other tribes. And so Jesus went there. If you look at 2 Kings chapter 15, Second Kings chapter 15, verse 29. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tigla Pauser, king of Assyria, came and took Ijon, Abel Beth, Makkah, Janoa, Kedesh, Hazor, Gilead, and Galilee all the land of Naphtali and he carried them captive into Assyria. Just like what I said. Oh. Yeah. So, in the Galilee area, all this, and mentioned Naphtali, and all this were taken by the Assyrian king into exile. And Jesus came from we were in darkness. Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth. The light came. The great light came. And the light has dawned on us 2,000 years ago. You follow me? So he, he will come for us as He came for them. So, this is our faithful John. Where the outcasts were, they were taken out, taken away. This were where the outcasts were. Over the years, they came back. And they came back, and they feel like outcasts, and, and there were plenty of Gentiles there. And Gentiles, they worship pagan gods. And these are the people with the greatest need. He didn't come for the righteous. He came for the sinners. And He came for them. He came for us. And... The good thing is, he loves the sinners. So we move on to verse 17. But before we do, since I mentioned just now, okay, let's look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 23. We, we haven't gone into the details of the ministry at Capernaum yet. That is later. But this is just an overview, introduction. And in Matthew 11, Jesus was releasing woe. Woe is the opposite of blessing to the impenitent cities. That means disobedient, disobedient cities. So you have woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. Yeah? If you had been, if all which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon, which are up in the north west coast. If you remember, even the Babylonians, Alexander the Great, went there. Uh, it will be more tolerable for them in the day of judgment than for you. And then now he points, verse 23, and you, Capernaum, that, is, that was the capital of Jesus' ministry, right? A lot of miracles done there. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven. That means great things are uh, of wonders, of grace, of heaven, <coughs> shown to them. And Jesus used the word are exalted, not were, because he was still with them. Will be brought down to Hades. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted 
to heaven, you will be brought down to Hades, hell. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, you know how terrible Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Become a pit of salt, the whole place. After all the rain or the rain of fire, it would have remained until this day. I mean, Sodom would have repented and they would be a city until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you, Capernaum. Lesson for us may it never happen to us because the more light we have received the more responsibility we have. And let it not be the day that you neglected the word of God, you neglected things that God has done in you, in your life, and you ignore Him. And if you do, then where Capernaum shall be, you and I can be there as well. And we don't want that. Okay? We want to hold fast our confession and not let go of our confession. Like it's so sad if you go to uh, Nazareth, Jesus was born there. Right? No, he was uh, Bethlehem. Ah, sorry, Bethlehem. Brought up in Nazareth. If you have gone to Bethlehem in Israel, I, I, I bring you as well. You see, today that whole place is more. Not so many Jews. Huh? Jewish, they are more Muslims. But it was supposed to be when Jesus was born and, and uh, the Jewish people and so on. But it is not. I always tell the tour, my tour group, you see, take a look. Does it look like a Jewish place? It is not. Okay. So, where are we? Verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say so from that time his public ministry started <clears throat> from that time jesus began to preach and to say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand repent what is repent repent means change direction from where you are going what you have been doing you turn around and that you will not go back to what you used to do before you came to know Jesus. So, repent for the kingdom of heaven. And as I mentioned uh, the last time we met, in Matthew, it is only in Matthew that he used kingdom of heaven. In the gospel of Matthew, all the others are kingdom of God. And this kingdom of heaven, is to talk, is to be, uh, describe to us the rule and the reign of God or of heaven over the earth. And many preachers and teachers, they use it interchangeably. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. But in, in the gospel, according to Matthew, it is kingdom of heaven. So if Jesus said kingdom of heaven, if there is a kingdom, there must be a King, correct? Yeah. Then call kingdom for what? There must be a king, and who is the king? Him, because he said, "Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." He is now here. He is with them. That's what he was saying. And as Jesus said this, when he proclaimed this, something so like sovereign like from God, he must be doing it in the office of a prophet. Because the prophet is one who echoes, who brings, what who represents God before men. Whatever God tells the prophet, he tells it to the people. So he was acting in the office of a prophet. He came forth and he just said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he was doing so in the capacity, in the office of a prophet. And this was not new. If they had known the scriptures, they would have known 
Deuteronomy 18.18. You know Deuteronomy 18.18. The people would have thought, hey, Moses, huh? you must be the prophet. Huh? You must be the prophet. Because you went up Mount Sinai and then you brought down the word, the commandments and, and the, the laws and everything. But what did, what did Moses tell them? And the Lord said to me, Moses, what they have spoken is good. I will miss what God told Moses. What they have said, what they have spoken is good, the people. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, like Moses, but this is capital P. A prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth he shall speak to them all that I command him and it shall be that whoever will not hear my words which he speaks in my name I will require it of him this is pointing to who? To Jesus and so Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 verse 17 in the office of a prophet he said repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And if you reject this, you don't repent, then God said, whoever will not hear my words which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. That means he will be to require his life. God doesn't want to kill us. He wants us to live forever. But for those who reject, he will require it of him. And he will be in his absence for all eternity. Verse 18. And now it's recruitment time. Recruitment time. And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee, you remember the picture up there, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And it is a beautiful lake. It is a beautiful lake. And it shapes like a heart. No? If you look at the shape. It looks like a heart. So, and we sail on the boat. And when you sail on a boat, uh, there's a flag raising ceremony. <laughs> you, you must be there to experience it. I better don't spoil the surprise. <laughs> it's just wonderful. But sometimes yeah. the, the cross winds come and it can be a bit uh, rough. And so on the shores, they are fishermen. And their livelihood depends on the catch that they can bring in. And so this day, when Jesus walked by, he's, he found two brothers, Simon called Peter. We will learn more about the names. You know, we have Petra, Petros, when we come to Matthew chapter 16. And his brother called Andrew. And what were they doing? Casting a net into the sea. And that means what? They were catching fish. Huh? And that is prophetic. That points to them, Peter, in particular Peter, he was the evangelist. He was the evangelist. Here he is casting net to catch fish. And Jesus said, I will make you fisher of men. You go and catch men. So, Peter went on to become the apostle of hope. Because the evangelist will go and preach the good news. Pointing to them. Showing to them. Telling them about the blessed hope. So the apostle of hope. We also notice that when Jesus went there, what were they doing? Sitting around, doing nothing. No. Jesus went to them as they were working. Whatever they were doing. And so God can call you and I wherever you are, whatever you are doing and using your talent to use you in his, according to His will. You follow me? 
So not everyone is called to come and be full-time in the church. You could be good with pen and paper. God can use you as a writer. You are good in the media, in the entertainment. God can use you there. You, you can be a politician and God will find you faithful, find you faithful and can use you there. And this were fishermen. And Jesus started his ministry. He need to fish men, fish for men. So he went to look for fishermen. So be faithful in whatever you do. God can find you and use you. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He did not tell Peter and Andrew, Hey, by the way, would you like to consider a second career? If you have the time, can we meet this evening after you finish work? He spoke with authority and he just commanded them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So for someone to say it with the authority, it is like someone who is a commander, who is commanding. So we know the chief commander is Jesus Christ. So now he's acting in the office of the king. So earlier he was acting in the office of a prophet, proclaiming the kingdom of heaven. Now he's acting in the office of a king, telling them, follow me. In essence, it means now. Now. Follow me. Leave your occupation now. And I will. Underline, I will. I will make you. So you say, but, Pastor, I cannot preach. Jesus, I never let oil cross before. I, I, I never sing before. I never do usher before. Who is making you? Who is going to prepare you? Who is going to equip you? God. God. Because whatever skill you have, He had already given to you. Now He's going to use your skill for His purpose. So He will make you. Do you understand? I never grew up in my secondary school days, university, or, or, or even JC days, of thinking that I will be a teacher or be a preacher. I told many times that actually I was so shy I could not even talk when, when I was called in class a shiver and, yeah. but God used me He chose you and He will equip you so if He calls you just surrender to His will not everyone will be teacher not everyone will be prophet not everyone will be pastor and so on there are other things in His kingdom that needs to be done maybe He wants you to use your transport to go and do something for Him so, I will. So, don't worry. When God calls, He will equip you. And I like verse 20. They immediately, this is a positive response. Uh, let me think about it. You always say this to insurance people. Let me think about it. Pastor yeah. uh, asks you do something. Your oikos dear asks you do. Uh, let me pray about it. Sounds so spiritual. <laughs> People who say think about it, pray about it, usually answer come back no one. They just want to be polite, don't they tell you, you know, no. So they immediately left their nets. Now leaving their nets, uh, that means leaving their business. That means leaving their livelihood. Now those days, uh, it's not like a uh, wow. Well, I got a few more properties at home. I got rental income. I got bank, I've got stock, stock and shares and okay lah, take a holiday with you, it's okay but it is catch the fish, sell the fish, they have money they bring, some they eat, some they, 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 they do whatever to purchase other things so that means leaving their business, leaving their livelihood, and they did and they followed him full time not part time now, when you ask hey, am I following Jesus? Full time or part time? So I part time now because I'm not earning salary in the office there, ma. Uh, you're also you're more part time than me. Uh, you don't come here Monday to Friday. Uh, is that so? No. When you follow him, you're always following full time, regardless of your vocation. 
is your attitude to God, your worship of Him, is it 24-7? You're acknowledging, you thank Him, you appreciate Him, you adore Him, you praise Him, you bless Him throughout the day. You are full-time. It doesn't matter whether you're academic, you're a technical person, you're a politician, you're a sports player, or you're full-time staff. And I can tell you there are full-time staff who are not full-time as you. Because, yeah, they are doing a job, but they don't pray like you, they don't read the Bible like you. They just do a job. Instead of working outside, they work in there. And they say they're full-time. They are full-time in terms of employment. But full-time with the Lord is your total commitment and dedication unto the Lord. And so they follow Him. Follow Jesus. Not follow men. Not follow men. Like right now with uh, the spread of virus, with the Korean church exposed, uh, the, what's the name? Si Jong. Okay, whatever. The pastor can say, you know, my church is the right one. All other churches are of Satan. Yeah. And only 144,000 will make it up there. The rest don't. It is really a cult. You follow me? So, don't follow men. Follow Jesus. Follow Him. Verse 21, going on from there, he saw two other brothers. So, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. So, uh, it looks like fishing was like a very common trade. People live off the land and they live off the sea. So here you have these two brothers and if you study later, uh, they are called sons of thunder. You know why sons of thunder? Because they've got bad temper, very hot temper. Not happy any. Jesus, why don't you call lightning and fire? Come now and strike them. We'll read that later. So anyway, so you have two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. And what were they doing? They were in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And again, it is quite prophetic. We look at John. Just now, the two brothers, we look at Peter. This one, uh, James and John, we look at John. John went on to be the apostle of what? Love. Peter was apostle of hope because Peter was always ministering to the churches uh, that were suffering. That he kept that, telling them to persevere. In fact, if you are punished for doing wrong, what good is there? But it is when you are punished, when you are doing good, ah, you know, persevere. Telling them about hope. That's Peter. When John, John is the apostle of love. He always said love. You go and read first John, love one another. No, it's love. So, what were they doing? Mending the boat. Mending the nets in the boat. And he went on to mend hearts. He went on to mend hearts. Apostle of love. And they were also working. They were mending their nets. He called them and immediately, immediately they left the boat and their father. Historians say the father uh, is quite rich. And so by leaving the nets, leaving their father, that means they are leaving everything. They are going empty. Forsaking whatever earthly treasures they have and inheritance from their father, they left and they followed Jesus. So they paid a price. And we all do pay a price by following Jesus. So, again, they follow Jesus, not, for, not following men. So now we go to verse 23. So we saw the office of the prophet, we saw the office of the king. Now we are left with the office of the priest. The office of the priest. And here, we have a few verses that tell us about the ministry of Jesus Christ. 
Verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And Jesus went about all of Galilee. All Galilee, this area, this whole area. Galilee. And you know the order. You know the order. He taught, he preached, and he healed. Right? Which comes first? He taught. <coughs> he taught where? He taught in their synagogues. Then he preached the gospel of the kingdom. Then he healed. Okay, let's look at teaching. Teaching comes first. And he went where? He went to the synagogue. Now, I have a picture here. I mentioned last Sunday at the, uh, at the Sunday service. Now, a typical outline of the synagogue is this. So you have, uh, the in the center, you have, this is like the pulpit, Dima. Yeah, this. Then you have seats on the left and on the right, and the women, they sit on one side. Then you have the lamp and then the ark. Not like the ark of the covenant, but it is like an enclosed space. Now this, for the Jews, they will come and then they will study the word and uh, the rabbi, or any learned person, scholar, anyone who knows the word, the scribe, the whoever, he can have the time at the pulpit and he can address the people and teach them the word, share with them the word. So it is always open to anyone who comes. And that's why Jesus took the opportunity and also Paul, when he traveled in his mission, called synagogue, he knows he will be given the opportunity. They will not reject yeah, but of course today's churches we are quite guarded we don't want any Tom and Harry to just come and then tell a different gospel but it was open so Jesus went and so this is the a diagram and then you have this if you go to a modern synagogue it is something like this so in the center is this and then the people are here and then here and then probably the women are here behind you. So, that is the synagogue. And what did he do in the synagogue? He taught. Why? Because the Jews would be familiar with the Word of God. The Old Testament. They know because from, from, from the day they were born, they were, they were taken through the Talmud, the, 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 the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, they know, they know the scriptures. So it is reaching out and expounding exposition, or explaining to the familiar, because these people are familiar with the scripture. So it's not like starting from ground zero, just pointing out to them. Maybe sometimes they just read the letter, but they don't have the spirit. So they don't have the revelation. We all read the same thing, but some people don't have the revelation. So the speaker or the teacher will go there and expound. So teaching in the synagogue. Then the next one is preaching the gospel of the kingdom. When you preach the gospel of the kingdom, you're preaching the good news to the unfamiliar. You follow me? You are encouraging the unfamiliar. These people do not know Christ. They do not know the good news. So you go and preach the good news to them. And so the first one is teaching the familiar people. Second one is encouraging the unfamiliar people. And the third one is the demonstration of the power. So and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. I underline my Bible for all. all. Today, today, I can't say it is happening as frequent as it was in the past. Some 
ministers in Africa, in other places, they, they seem to have that gift and, and they are doing praise the Lord. But uh, even for us, we do mission. We go to Indonesia, we go to Philippines, we go to Thailand, we pray and they get healed. But in, in Singapore, when we pray for them, not all have the same, receive the same healing. I don't have all the answers. All we do is we just pray. It is the sovereignty of God. But when Jesus was doing it, 10 out of 10, uh, all kinds of diseases, all kinds of sickness, and they were healed. And it was wonderful. But the point I want to make is, you notice the order, there was teaching, and there was preaching, and then there was demonstration of the power of healing. But some people come along and they just do emphasize only on healing, healing, healing. Now it's died down, but I think like some 15, 20 years ago, there are people who just come to town and just do nothing but healing. Just healing, healing. The word is like secondary, just healing, healing. Uh, then you get people chasing you from stadium to stadium, from church to church, and then all they want is healing, healing. Now, even if you, uh, there was one uh, person who, uh, well, I can't remember the name. Yeah. And he just focused on healing, healing, but the word is so, the, the proportion of time given to the word is so limited. So, we follow Jesus' ministry. Teaching, preaching, and healing. Verse 24, Then, his fame went throughout all Syria, Go back to the back. So you see, a lot of boxes here. I mean, the box are a lot of description. So all the diseases and healing is over. And Syria is where? Syria is up there. Syria is up there. Up north. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted in va with various diseases and torments and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics, and he, underline, and he healed them. Jesus heals them. Jesus still heals today. Verse 25. So, before that, by verse 24, his fame went out even outside of Israel to Syria and all the sick, paralyzed people, epileptic, all came and they, he healed them. So, as you study the gospel, you realize the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those who oppose him never questioned Jesus' ability to heal, me, to heal the sick. They never. They just had to say something. And they said, huh, you must be working in the name of the devil. You must be working by the power of Beelzebub, yeah, the Lord of the Flies. But they never said he did not. Yeah, he healed them, but he must be of the devil. So that is his, you know, his signature. He heals. Verse twenty-five. Great multitudes followed him, and from where? From Galilee. From Galilee here. To Decapolis means across the Jordan into Decapolis. What is Decapolis? Deca means what? Ten. Polis means cities. So it is a community of ten cities. So this place, Decapolis. And from from where? Great multitudes following from Galilee and from Decapolis. Jerusalem, down south, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So everywhere, people just followed him. Now, last December, we went to Jirasa. Here. We went to here. Beautiful place. The two main places we went in, in uh, Jordan, before we went into Israel, we went here, uh, Jerasa. The other one is Mount Nebo, which is somewhere here. Okay. Where Moses 
went up to look into the promised land, but he could not go into the promised land. But Jerasa, then Jerasa, we, we saw the ruins of the place and evidence of Jesus' ministry in Jerasa when, as it was here described, recorded for us in Matthew chapter 4, uh, 23, just read. So he, his ministry, he went from here to Decapolis, and then others all followed him. So, Jerasa. Now, Jerasa from here, Galilee to here. If you look over the River Jordan, it is like a long distance. Quite long. Um, my, my record here shows about 100 miles from the Galilee side all the way to uh, Decapolis, that side. Quite long. And those days, uh, got no bus, no plane, no train, no nothing, right? So either they did it on foot or with a pony. So Jesus did not have it easy. Heat in the day, cold in the night, and he went through all this. Why? To bring light to the darkness. So, let's not be like the people of Capernaum, which means comfort. And they got so comfortable, they just receive, receive, receive only. But they did not give. They did not give of their time, their resources. They did not go further than that. But Jesus did, he gave, and he gave, and he gave. So, for us, uh, simply, it just cross the road, we have a pingy, you know, right? I'll go Badok North or somewhere else, or Badok Reservoir. Yeah. Uh, some of us, we take plane and we go further, some take ship and go to Indonesian islands and so on. Whatever the Lord has called you to do, enable you to do, just do it. And don't be like the people in Capernaum just receive and be comfortable. And you might just be identified with them or locate, located with them in the future, which you don't want. Okay, so uh, this seemingly short but very long chapter that we have just covered today is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. After he was water baptized, after he was tempted, which he overcame for our sake. That we can now do like what he did as he ministered to the people in Galilee and beyond. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for this good news that has been recorded for us. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, the merciful and faithful one who was tempted at every point and yet without sin. So Lord, we want to be likewise. And as we hold fast to the confession, we pray that your grace and your mercy be upon us, be in us, work in and through us, and help us in every situation, at every point, that we too shall be overcomers as we serve you in the field. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.